Let's pray. Jesus, we are grateful today for your presence in our lives. Come and teach us. Come and fill our hearts with yourself, because when we have you, we have everything we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> so I've been thinking about what my wife and I have been experiencing the last few weeks, the death of her brother. We had his memorial service last, uh, last Sunday. And... Uh, put his ashes in the ground on Monday morning on a little hill outside of uh, Great Falls, Montana. And it was some good, bad times. What do I say? We were together with family, but there were a lot of tears. And tomorrow we're having my sister's memorial service over in San Diego. I'll be driving there this afternoon. So, you know, I don't want the subject of the church to become our issues. On the other hand, it seemed a little strange to just carry on as if nothing happened. So I'm going to take one Sabbath morning and talk about the things that I've been meditating on for the last six weeks. After I drink some water. just going to look at two Bible verses. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 17. I see I have the title there wrong. is 13 to 15. I do, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. None of us want to be ignorant, right? We want to be wise. We want to be well-informed. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant or unaware, brethren, and I think we can add the sisters in there as well, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Now, what's he talking about? People that are taking a nap? No, he's talking about people who are dead. The Bible's favorite term for sleep is death. The devil's first lie. Genesis chapter 3 is that when you die, you're not dead. But you go to a more godlike existence. And almost every single uh, religion, including most of Christianity, believe that when you die, you're not really dead. You go to some higher existence. I've never heard of anyone go to a lower existence at death. Even though there are many who believe that you go to heaven or hell when you die, I've never been a funeral where they preached him into hell. Can be the biggest scoundrel on planet Earth, but all of a sudden he was a really nice guy. Um, and of course, that's the very meaning of the word eulogy. You is a prefix for good in the Greek, and logos is for word. A eulogy is a good word. <laughs> when you have a funeral, you don't say anything bad about the person, you just say all the good. And I think that's actually good. Um, but he's talking about those who have died. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, who are asleep in the grave. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. If you think about it, this world offers you absolutely no hope. For everyone that buys into the philosophy of this world, you're headed for a dead end. Literally. And Paul says we're going to sorrow when we lose loved ones, but we do not sorrow as those who have no hope, which means we sorrow with hope. What is hope? I was thinking about hope. Hope is not a thing that sits on the shelf. You know, here's a bowl of hope. You go into the restaurant and you, you uh, order a sandwich of faith and a bowl of hope. Bowl of, uh, it doesn't work that way. 
as I've mentioned before, when we say someone is a man of faith or a woman of faith, that is an incomplete thought. Because faith has to be in something or someone. Faith isn't just faith, a man of faith. Well, what is his faith in? You know, his money, his power, his fame, the tooth fairy. What is your faith in? As I've said before, when you talk about righteousness by faith, that's an incomplete sentence. It's righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And the same with hope. Hope has to be in something or someone. Now, it's interesting. After you get done with the Gospels and you get into the book of Acts, on to the end of the New Testament, it talks more about the resurrection than it talks about the cross. Because remember, once you hit the book of Acts, the cross is done. It's in the bank. Jesus has lived. Jesus has died. Jesus has been in the grave. Jesus has risen again. Jesus has ascended on high. That's done. Nothing in the universe can undo what was done. And the doing of that was a lot of work. I mean, God went to a lot of trouble to leave heaven, come down to this dump, and spend a life here, and then in trying to get his people to fall back in love with him, instead they just went ahead and killed him. The hard work is done, people. And it's in the bank, and nothing can reverse the fact that Jesus has lived a perfect life for you. He has died all of your sins. And this is ringing. Can I get one of you back there to please lower this mic a little bit? Uh, Christy, uh, I need a little help here. Um, this mic is ringing. Can you pull it down a little bit? I would appreciate it. I thank you very much. All right. Um, it is done. There's nothing in the universe that can undo the fact that your sins have been handled. A seat in the lifeboat has been made for you. It's done. Satan can't change that. All the powers of hell can't change that. The hard work is done. All that's left is to come back and get us. Right? That's the easy part. Certainly, if he did all the hard part, he's going to finish up with the easy part, right? Right? All that's left is the party at the end. And that's our hope. But our hope isn't really in the resurrection, even though it is. Our hope is in Jesus, who is the resurrection. Right? If all we did was get resurrected, it wouldn't be that good. You want to live forever in this dump? No, thank you. It's about being with Jesus. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We have a hope. The hope is in the resurrection, but the resurrection is in Jesus. We'll be raised to be with him. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that? That's in the bank. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, if you're going to go get somebody who's asleep, what's the first thing you have to do? Wake them up. Say, wake up. Let's go. So it says he'll bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Well, how does he do that? Well, this we say by the word of the Lord. So Paul says, I didn't make this up. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Some of us will be alive until Jesus comes. There will be some saved people that Satan hasn't managed to kill. <laughs> Even though we're going to go through great tribulation, such as never was since there was a time in this world, there will be those who are still alive when Jesus comes. He won't have to wake them up. Those of us who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now, for Paul to say this makes the point that evidently there were those back then who believed that the living would get to be with the Lord before the dead. And we do read in Corinthians... 
1 Corinthians 15, that there were a whole bunch of people who, based on the Greco, the, 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 the Greco-Roman, the Greek mindset, in the Greek mindset, a bodily resurrection is complete idiocy. Because in the Greek mindset, the body is the boat anchor that's keeping the soul from being able to thrive. So your soul is stuck in this body, but when you die, you're free. Well, then why in the world would you want a bodily resurrection and get stuck back in that prison again? So you have to understand the bodily resurrection is ridiculous to the Greek mindset. And we still live in a Greek mindset, by the way. So evidently, back then, there were those who believed that when you die, it was too late. The only ones that were going to make it, I guess, were those who were alive when Jesus came. i got to stay alive till he comes back. So Paul says, the living will not precede the dead. Now, most people believe today that the dead precede the living. It's very interesting. We're just, we've reversed that now. But what does Paul say? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And evidently that's enough to wake up the dead. And the dead in Christ, those who are asleep, will rise first. Then, now when Jesus comes, there are going to be two groups of saved people. The living and the dead. After the trumpet shout, there's only one group, the living, <laughs> right? Because the dead are now with the living. We're all alive. And then we who are alive and remain, that would be everybody now, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. That's how he's going to bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. He's going to come, wake them up, gather them together, and bring them with him back to the place he has prepared. Does that make sense? Which takes us to John 14, where Jesus says to the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Now the context is, in the upper room, after the Last Supper, he says to his disciples, by the way, I'm leaving. I'm going away, and you cannot come along now. And the disciples say, why not? We want to come. We're not leaving you. <laughs> Jesus says, unfortunately, you're all going to forsake me tonight. You're all going to leave me. Peter says, not me, even if they all, not me. Jesus says, well, you're going to be denying me with cursing and swearing before dawn. And then he says, let not your heart be troubled. And by the way, that's a command. The Greek has a part of speech we don't have in English, and that is a third-person imperative. A command in the third person makes no sense in our language. If I say stand, I mean you stand, right? I don't mean he stand or she stand or it stand, but you can do that in the Greek. And that's why it's, it's, it's saying, it's speaking to the heart. Don't be troubled. Let it not be troubled. That's a command. It's also in the passive, which means the troubling is something that's happening to you not something you're actually doing. So how can you not let happen something that's happening to you? <laughs> you get the problem? You know, when I was sitting back in the uh, sound booth talking with Glenn Williams on a Friday evening, the 18th of August, and I got a phone call that said, your sister just died. That was troubling. Now, how am I going to not let that trouble me? You get troubled by those things. When Marilyn got the call, her brother had passed away on the 15th of September. That was troubling. And yet Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. How do you do that? We have to keep reading. 
literally, now it's second person imperatives, you be trusting in God. And you be trusting in me. I find a direct comparison here. There's no way I can just not be troubled by trouble that troubles me. But I can choose through the trouble to keep trusting in God and keep trusting in Jesus. That's something I can actually choose to do. If I focus on trying not to be troubled, the harder I try not to be troubled, the more troubled I'll be. Right? Try hard not to be afraid. <laughs> you know? You're a little kid. You're laying in your bed. It's dark. And you're sure there are spooks under the bed. And you try to get over the spooks by thinking about the spooks. No. You're going to just be more and more terrified. So what does that little child do? Gets out of bed and runs into mommy's and daddy's room, right? Says, I want to crawl in bed with you. There are spooks under my bed. They put their trust in the father, in the mother, in somebody else. Mom and dad are bigger than anything. They're even bigger than spooks under the bed. So let not your heart be troubled. Don't let the troubles that are troubling you trouble you. Is impossible to do, but you can choose to redirect your thoughts and your focus to no matter how much trouble there is, I'm going to keep trusting in God. I'm going to keep trusting in Jesus. And remember, trusting is a relational word. And the only way you trust is by getting to know someone. You go get with your father. You go get with Jesus. You get close to them. You spend time with them. That's the only way you're going to get through the trouble without being troubled. In my father's house are many mansions. I have heard entire sermons on picturing my mansion. What's it going to be like? I've heard great descriptions, people's dreams for their mansion. I'm here to trouble you. That word has nothing to do with an opulent, large, multi-roomed dwelling place. The word mansion actually shows up because originally in the Latin Vulgate, a translation that was heavily leaned on by the King James people back in the uh, 1600s when they translated the King James Version, the Latin Vulgate, translated many centuries before that, uses the word mansio, mansio, from which you get mansion, mansion, okay? Um, and in the Latin, that word does not mean an opulent, large, multi-room, fancy dwelling. It means the same thing that the Greek word meno means, which is an abiding place. It has more to do with permanence and togetherness than in the structure. In fact, it has nothing to do with the structure. I'm told that the early English word mansion also had that same concept. It was not initially meaning a uh, fancy building. It meant an abiding place, a place where you stay, where you belong. So it says, in my father's house are many abodes, literally. The Greek word in John 15, abide in me and I in you. This is simply the noun version of that word. In my father's house are many abodes. Now, an abode, an abiding place, is a place you're never going to be set away from. The Spanish translates this in several of the Spanish translations of the Bible, permanecer, a permanent place permanent place. Now, Jesus has just said, I'm going away, I'm leaving. So our relationship is being separated by space. But in my Father's house are many places where we'll never be separated. 
this has absolutely nothing to do with the opulence or the shape or the whatever of the place. It has to do with the fact that Jesus says there will come a time when we will never be separated again. You will have a permanent room in my dad's big hacienda. But it has nothing to say about the room. It's about the being. Now, I don't think God's house is going to be a trash heap. We live in a world that's had 6,000 years, six millennia of Satan's wrecking ball. And it's still a pretty marvelous place. On our drive to uh, Great Falls and back, we went up the back way through Kanab, Utah, and, and up through uh, to Salt Lake that way instead of just hitting the freeway all the way to Vegas and up. And there's some incredible views up through the uh, Grand Staircase, Escalante, and through there. Some amazing stuff. And we're looking at the at the uh, the bony structure of the earth. <laughs> it doesn't even have its skin on it, you know, uh, anymore. And that's beautiful, right? So I'm not suggesting that being with God is going to be in a dump. But I am suggesting that God has never held out a carrot that says, Here's, here's some gold and a mansion and a fancy place and all your desires fulfilled uh, if, if you'll just come home. You think about the... Uh, think about poor Bill Gates. Poor Bill Gates. He just got divorced. How in the world is he ever going to find a girlfriend? And have a clue whether she likes him or just wants his money. Right? We have the whole story of the king and the pauper, you know, where the, 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 the young king disguises himself as the, as the street urchin in order to try to find love. Somebody that he actually knows loves him and doesn't just love being the queen. kind of interesting what God did. He came down as a very ordinary person and invited us to fall in love with him. And you know, he hasn't done too well. Right? The majority said, no, thank you. We love you as long as you give us food and healing. But when he finally said in John 6, no, I'm just going to give you me, they left in mass. And they ended up killing him. What's the name of that uh, British singer? Rod Stewart. Remember Rod Stewart? He's got a really raspy voice. Mine's getting more that way, but they're not paying me like they paid him. The guy's been married over and over and over again. And he said, the next time I fall in love, I'm just going to buy her a house. If you're wealthy, how do you find love? How do you know? God doesn't hold out a carrot and say, I'll give you gold if you'll come to heaven. So I just kind of want to debunk the whole mansion idea. It's about being together. It's about falling in love with Jesus and moving in to live with him and the Father forever. Now, it's going to be a pretty nice place because God doesn't live in junk. But it's not about the place. And if you got to the place because you wanted to go to the place, when you got to the place, you wouldn't be at the place because the place is him, not a place even though it is a place. I don't know that makes no sense, but you get it? There's only one way to get to heaven, and that is to fall in love with Jesus. Now, when you get Jesus, you get everything, but you can't fake falling in love with someone who can read your thoughts. <laughs> it's got to be the real deal. You actually have to choose Jesus.
You can't choose Jesus in order to get a mansion. You can't choose a mansion in order to get Jesus. You just choose Jesus, and whatever Jesus gives will be fine because we'll be with him. In my Father's house are many abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not telling you fables. I am going to prepare a place for you. That's a promise. And then he says, and it's actually in the subjunctive tense, and if I might go, and if I might prepare a place for you. He hasn't done it yet, so it's still in the contingency when he's talking here. But if I go to all that work, the next phrase is not actually in the future tense. It's in the present ongoing. I am coming again, and now it's future. I will receive you to myself. Notice, he says, I'm going to go prepare an abiding place, and if I go do that, obviously, if I go do that, I'm going to come back and get you, and I will receive you to myself. It doesn't say I'll receive you to my mansion. I will receive you alongside, literally, to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's all about being with the person. The place will be great, but the place wouldn't be great if the person wasn't there. If we got to heaven and Jesus wasn't there, it wouldn't be heaven. Now the next verse, verse 4, has always bothered me when I read this. And where I am going, it's in the ongoing tense, you know. And the way you know. And I'm reading it and I'm thinking, no, I'm not sure that I know. And by the way, that word for know there is an intellectual knowing, and it's always in the passive tense. Um, not, not passive, perfect tense. Which infers you already know. So Jesus says, I'm going to prepare this place for you, and then I'm going to receive you to myself, and we'll be there together forever. You'll never, we'll never be, we're going to be parted now, but once I come back and get you, we'll never part again. And you already know where I'm going, and you already know the way. Now, I think Jesus was um, either goading or guiding them into asking a question. I learned something very young. You'll never get the right answer unless you ask the right question. I remember being told that and thinking about that, and I never forgot it. It's kind of like, I'm going to move quick through another slide here. It's kind of like I read this uh, statement from Morris Venden that I came across uh, from 1975. Jesus was an expert in not giving answers, but in frustrating people to discover truth for themselves. I like that. I used that in the last sermon two weeks ago, in case you remember. And I think Jesus is doing exactly that here. Now, you guys already know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. Because he's wanting them to say, and they technically do know. They just don't know they know. So he's trying to get them to, and sure enough, Thomas comes through and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I'm glad you asked. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way, and the Father is the place. Once again, it's not about mansions and glory. It's about Jesus and the Father. The original sin was when we broke relationship with God at the tree. We told him to get lost. We're going to run off with somebody else. We think we'll find more life with somebody else than we will with you, God. 
And what's the first thing God did after that? He came walking in the cool of the day saying, what happened? And ever since then, he's been walking up to us saying, can we get back together? And most of the world has been saying, no, get lost. We think we'll find more life somewhere else. And some of us have received that gift of reconciliation, but we still struggle with the idea that if we really follow Jesus, will we gain life or lose life? You know, I actually had a friend, he's not here today, that's good, who said, I actually came back to Jesus thinking I was giving up the fun in life, but I wanted, I didn't want to end up in hell. So I was willing to give up the fullness of life here so I didn't up in the, end up in the bad place later. You'll never get to heaven by wanting heaven. You'll only get to heaven by wanting Jesus. And if you got there and Jesus wasn't there, it wouldn't be heaven. Even if there were streets of gold and gates of pearl. And you had a mansion. It's all about being with a person. I skipped the slide. I'm going to go back. Uh, Billy Joel is not any place I would normally go to get the gospel. Many of you are too young to even have a clue who Billy Joel was. But a great pianist and singer, but not a godly person. But I remember years ago, back in 73, he wrote a song, the chorus of it, Home Could Be the Pennsylvania Turnpike, Indiana's Early Morning Dew, High in the Hills of California. Home is just another word for you. It doesn't matter where we are. What matters is that we're together. And I believe that's what this whole passage, both of these passages are saying, is we're not going to be together for a while, but I'm going to make a place where we'll, where we'll be together forever, and then I'll come and get you, and I'll take you to where we'll be together forever. I'll come down, I'll shout, I'll wake up the dead, and, and we'll always be together. It's about being together. Yes, I believe the place will be splendid. But wanting the place will never get you to the place. You have to be in love with Jesus. And you can't fake love with someone who can read your thoughts. It's got to be the real thing. There will be streets of gold. The fable says that there was a man, who, very rich man, who finally taught God into letting him take a little of his gold with him to heaven. So he arrives at the pearly gate with a bag. And Peter says, you can't bring anything in here. He says, I talked with God. He said, I could just a little bit. Well, Peter says, can I look at what's in the bag? Sure. He opens up the bag and he, Peter looks in there and he says, pavement? Gold in heaven is just asphalt. I haven't seen any of you digging up asphalt and putting it in your safe deposit box. God can make all the gold he wants. And we all know if you just print money, the money becomes worthless. Gold's not going to be of any more value in heaven than anything else. The whole place is going to be made of gold and precious stones. It's, it's going to be gorgeous, yes. But the value of heaven is not the gold. The value of heaven is you. You realize God can never make another you. Now, to make that point, I'm going to tell you a stupid joke. The shepherd was playing his flute one day, and all of a sudden the ram in the flock put his head down, ran as fast as he could across the meadow, straight into a tree, and killed himself. And the shepherd realized he'd been playing, there'll never be another you.
you got to be an English speaker for that, E-W-A-E-U, you know, female, uh, sheep. Okay, but I want you to remember the point. There will never be another you. That took a little while, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. There will never be another you, Y-O-U. God can't even make another you. If he made another you, he'd know it was a clone and wasn't you. Right? The only thing unique about heaven is the people. The gold's going to be everywhere. It's all about being together. Thus, we will always be in heaven. It doesn't say that. It says, thus, we will always be with the Lord. It's about being together. That's why the great commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love his kids as yourself. That's what living forever is going to be all about. We are going to be a place in a place where all is love. With everyone forever. And if you're not into that, it will be hell. And he won't make you be there. You'll never get to the place by trying to get to the place. You only get to the place by getting with the person. And if you get with the person to get the place, you'll never get to the place. <laughs> you have to get with the person because you want the person. And then you'll end up in the place because the place is where the person is. We flock to Jesus when he gives us food and healing, but we leave him when he says, now I'm going to give you myself. You know, the loneliest place in the world is at the top. The loneliest place, the Satan's approach to life is scramble to the top. When you get to the top, you're alone. And the most unhappy people in the world are the people who are alone at the top. How does a Bill Gates or an Elon Musk, or how does a Putin find love? You know, I, I've heard it that um, dictators have to be dictators for life, because if you ever stop being a dictator, somebody will kill you. Once you get to the top, you can't go out for a milkshake. You can't go out for a burger. You can't go out for a walk in the park. 30 years ago when I lived near San Francisco, a guy across the street used to be a bass player for one of the big bands of the 70s and 80s. He was famous. And now he'd settled down in a neighborhood to raise his children and got me involved with umping for Little League because that's what he was doing. He was being a, he was a normal dude on the street now. Nobody really knew who he'd been. But he said playing in the band was fun and then it became totally lonely because you play, you go to your hotel room. You can't leave your hotel room because there are screaming fans out there. So he said, we started doing stupid stuff just to keep from being bored. We dropped TVs out the window, you know, just to... Because being at the top, you're all alone. Satan's approach is scramble your way to the top and you end up all alone. God's approach is a mad scramble to the bottom to lift each other up in love. And you end up in community. And love is what makes life worth living. Money never made life worth living. Even food didn't make life worth living. Love is what makes life worth living. And I believe in the resurrection. And I believe... And my loved ones died in Jesus. And I believe we're going to be together again. But my hope isn't even in that. My hope's in Jesus. And if I have Jesus, I'll have everything. So he says, don't let it bother you when bothering things happen. Put your focus on trusting me. I'm creating an abiding place where we'll never be apart again. 
And if I go to the work to do that, I'll come and get you. I'll take you and we will be together forever. It's not about the place. It's about the people. It's about the relationships. It's about the love. It's about being together forever. And that's what we have to look forward to. And it seems that when we are faced with death, it forces us to stop and think about these things. And that's the only good thing about death. Is sometimes it's only when we face death that we actually face life. How am I living? Am I living in a way that matters? Am I investing in that scramble to the bottom to lift others up? Or am I investing in trying to get to the top where I'm going to end up all alone? <clears throat> am I trying to get to a place? Or am I coming to a person? The only way any of us will ever be in that place is if we have genuinely fallen in love with the person of Jesus Christ and the Father. And if you read on, Jesus says, don't worry about the Father. If you've met me, you've met him. You'll like him just as much as you like me. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for hope. Hope in the resurrection, but really hope in you who are the resurrection. Get our minds off of things that, well, get our mind off of things and on to you. May we make 100% of our focus be on knowing you, on reuniting in relationship with you. Because the, the thing that will make heaven heaven and the new earth the new earth is not Eden restored and golden streets. It's that we will be together with you and with each other forever. Thank you for this hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.